students continuing with the unit 4 in which we have uh, till now we have covered what is corporate social responsibility why corporate social responsibility is in the benefit of business and we also did various models of corporate social responsibilities namely the statist model and the other models of trusteeship model and the latest model which is the stakeholders model we all dis we discussed everything of that and i also gave you uh, in the unit 4 till now importance of code of ethics <coughs> why companies enforce code of ethics and we gave you various examples of conflict of interest we also did a we did three cases of conflict of interest till now in today's presentation we will cover a few things first is corporate responsibility of business to different group of stakeholders and we are going to cover three important stakeholders first is consumers and community second is employee and third is the responsibility of business to owners and inter business establishment so you can say these are all internal stakeholders and when we talk of community and consumers these are external stakeholders but they are important for the survival of the business also we will cover a bit of uh, corporate social responsibility because uh, we have till now discussed the CSR we have discussed why it is beneficial but we have not really covered the steps which company takes to attain corporate social responsibility or implementing the corporate social responsibility also we will discuss especially in Indian context what are obstacles obstacles in implementing the corporate social responsibility project and I will take the uh, I have studied the FIKI survey of 2016 in which there are they have enumerated 10 obstacles which are fairly common in implementing corporate social responsibility remember for us in India corporate social responsibility has attained special significance why because under section 135 of the new companies act 2013 CSR CSR is no longer just a voluntary service CSR has become mandatory for some companies who have certain net worth certain sales or certain net profits 5 crores of net profit and so they have to mandatorily spend 2% 2% of their profit in CSR related projects I have given you the examples of Indian Oil Corporation how well after the uh, after 2014 how well they have been able to implement their CSR, CSR projects in a more focused manner in a more balanced manner I have explained to you all the reportings which are required all the uh, the committees which are to be constituted by all such companies for whom CSR is mandatory I have also explained to you that uh, there is a provision of punishment also penalties also on companies who fail to fulfill their CSR obligations I have also discussed with you that India perhaps is the only country where CSR is mandated by law by a diktat I also discussed with you whether it is good or not so let's go to the uh, presentation in the first presentation why what is the duty of a corporate towards its employee uh, first is towards its customers and other stakeholders I want you to remember that uh, prior to 2014 the year of imp implementation CSR was not it is not that CSR in India did not exist it was very much there and uh, big companies have impeccable records of CSR but only that it did not have the government uh, backing in terms of a law another thing I also want to tell you and to be fair to all sides that when government introduced uh, 
the successive governments rather they have enforced mandatory spending of csr 2% but also they have taken steps to reduce the corporate income tax i am saying this only to give a balanced picture so while i personally feel that csr should be largely voluntary and not mandatory but uh, we have to follow all the rules abide by all the rules by the government as good corporate citizens So let us first understand the corporate responsibility of business towards consumers and community. And uh, once again, we are uh, trying to take the uh, research which has been done by uh, Professor A.C. Fernando and from his book, Business Ethics and Corporate Governance. First thing which Professor Fernando says is the goods or the services he says goods but I'm adding services, they must meet the requirement of different classes, their taste and purchasing power. What it means is that whatever the target segment the business has chosen to serve, the goods must meet the requirement and the expectations, their taste, their purchasing power. So there is a hint when we, when uh, <coughs> Professor Fernando talks about purchasing power, there is a hint that products must be value for money and it is contained in the second point which he enumerates is goods must be reasonably priced, must be made of dependable quality and sufficient variety. So there should be, offering should be such that people have something to choose from. Quality should be dependable. Because dependable is the hallmark of quality. Reasonably priced. Now what is reasonably priced is open to discussion. This is something which is open to uh, debate. Because some people can say what is pricing? Pricing is cost plus pricing. The opponents can say that if it is cost plus then inefficiencies can creep in. <clears throat> Remember there was a time when public sector oil companies, they were assured of cost plus 14% return on investment. It was 12 or 14, I am forgetting, but during, so very good pricing. It takes care of all the costing, but it leads to inefficiency because if you are inefficient, it will be, your inefficiencies will be covered in the cost. But broadly, we can say, like in the first point, we said that, uh, Purchasing power of the people who use these services or these goods and they should be reasonably priced. These are the responsibilities of business towards consumers. When we say consumer, the consumer community as a whole, not one consumer. Consumer community as a whole. If it's an industrial product, then of course all the industrial houses who patronize your product. <clears throat> Third is that provision of after sale service and guidance and maintenance. What does it mean? that a new company comes with white goods, let us say uh, you have bought a car or you have bought a washing machine, but you suddenly find that there is no after sale service. There are no spare parts available. Fourth is that widespread distribution of goods and service among all consumers and community. Provision of free competition and prevention of concentration of goods in the hands of limited number of producers or purchaser or groups. This is very important. Here what Professor Fernando is saying, first of all distribution should be widespread. <coughs> so it does not mean that, let us take the example of uh, petroleum products. So on the highway, the product sales is very brisk. In the cities, in the bigger towns, product sales is very brisk. <coughs> But in the village, the consumption of diesel of petrol is less. Consumption of diesel is there during the agriculture season because people use it for a variety of purpose, for their pump sets, for the purpose of their tractors, tractor trolleys. But should the, or let us take the case of Northeast where the demand is low, the cost of logistics is high, the margin consequently is less. So does it mean that the company will not 
<coughs> distribute the product in northeast another thing which professor fernando is hinting is free competition prevention there should be he is talking of anti trust anti trust means trust does not mean that faith wala trust trust means when manufacturers come together when manufacturers come together they form a trust so that they are able to control pricing fifth point which is the corporate responsibility of business to consumer and communities product and services your organization should present a good image in the mind of public the public your product should stand for honesty and integrity of character <coughs> Six point, and to my mind, a very very important point is, advertising policy should be based on moral, ethical principles. It should not mislead by false, misleading, and exaggerated advertisement. This fairness cream will improve your skin tone and the and the skin color. It will lighten your skin in fifteen days. this is not only not only promotion of something which is as unethical of giving one particular shade of skin a place in the society which is on a higher pedestal this is wrong <clears throat> and second thing is it should not be a false claim it should not be a false claim another responsibility of business is that it should support educational charitable and other programs for the benefit of the community now here we are moving from consumers we are going to community wherever business can support any charitable cause the business must support the cause business must have social accountability accountability to consumers what is accountability means that people can hold you responsible for something wrong or right so if you are manufacturing a product let us say a car in which you find that the braking system is not as per standards and you recall all the cars and replace the braking system then that means that means you are acting in a responsible manner but if you keep quiet about it you are not only being irresponsible you are being inhuman because you are jeopardizing the life of many car drivers this is something no company no company should think of doing so company should not shirk away from the basic responsibility towards the consumers and the community professor fernando also says that uh, business must conduct itself in a manner that it avoids leading to any kind of a moral or social danger of high spots and social tensions so what is a high spot high spot is generally you know the most exciting part of a sport or suppose you are visiting uh, you are visiting a country and you say the high spot was meeting the uh, head of that republic or meeting the prime minister of that country is a high spot you know so <clears throat> what professor fernando is saying business must not give projections of for example if you use this uh, product that that is the high spot of your life so you should not try to project something as if if you don't get that pro that product uh, your life is meaningless business should generally not not create social tensions sell your product advertise your product use any theme but don't use themes which increase the chasm between rich and non rich poor uh, poor and rich haves and have nots this is this is what i could make out from uh, what professor fernando means point number 10 he says is business 
should prevent growth of slums, improvement of housing conditions, elimination of crimes in industrial areas by providing training and job counseling. So here it is talking of the role of business. And this is true in case of businesses which are industrialized because wherever there are <coughs> industries, we find there are slums. And uh, maybe the business pays well to the employees, but those who provide secondary or tertiary services uh, to the business, you know, they continue to remain uh, in the hell hole of poverty. So these are, see, this is this in his mind is, especially in industrialized sectors like Western India or highly industrialized sectors, business must try to take care of the community. He says business should have a progressive outlook. It should be law abiding citizens. That means to pay all the dues on time, all the taxes on time, fully and honestly. Must not try to cheat. You should not try to back calculate that this is going to be my uh, gross profit and I have to pay 30% tax. So can I divert a part of this profit, uh, profit just to avoid paying more tax? See, <clears throat> suppose you want to, you think you will end up paying a tax of uh, uh, 20 crore rupees on a gross profit of uh, 100 crore. I'm just thinking aloud. So you say, why should I leave 100 crore as a profit? Can I reduce it by buying something more, by doing this, doing that? No harm in tax planning, but to try to reduce the overall profit just because you don't want to pay that much of tax, this will fall in the purview of not being honest. Another point, very important point is, he says business should maintain impartiality towards political affairs. Business, not employees. <clears throat> so, you are employing people, you can't tell them or you can't, you should not try to, try to be partial towards a political party. You should maintain distance. Abstain from direct political environment. Not to support political parties. This is a contentious issue. Some of the businessmen are politicians today. A lot of businesses are businessmen are, are politicians. Professor Fernando says business should follow honest trade practices and uh, avoid activities leading to restrain of trade and commerce. And he also urges businesses to try not to contact public centers for uh, public servants for selfish ends. They should not sell communities which are adulterated. So I think I think this is a reasonably comprehensive list or enumeration of what is corporate responsibilities, corporate responsibility of business to consumers and to community. Not a final list by any means, but quite a comprehensive list. It covers consumers and it covers community. It even talks about, uh, perhaps this is the only book wherein I found a note about should what should be the involvement of businesses and politics. So I actually like this list and I thought I should share it with my students. Because this is a question which is asked several times that what is the corporate responsibility of business towards its stakeholders? So customers and community, employees and to the business owners and uh, other related businesses. So in this uh, part, I would like to take up uh, what is the corporate responsibility of business towards employees? Employees, as you know, they are central to any corporation, any company, any enterprise. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, once I was actually, uh, I, I went to the office of a company which was into construction of roads and it was a new company and I was invited there like, you know, for the inauguration of that company that day and I was one of the many guests invited. So, uh, before they started the party, the inauguration party, the, their CEO or their owner, it was not a very big enterprise. 
he gave a presentation about the company and he says they have a experience of building several lakh kilometers of road that they have constructed several lakh kilometers of national highway state highway and district major district roads so <laughs> after the presentation i went up to the guy he was the ceo is a he was known to me that's why i was there in that function i asked him i said uh, my friend excellent presentation you gave an overview of the uh, road projects in india and how much the how the road construction business is contributing to the gross domestic product of the country all is fine but why did you say that your organization has built several or constructed several lakh kilometers of national highway yours is a new company you are starting he smiled and he told me he says dr bhisht our company has 20 employees 20 engineers and we are embarking embarking upon a major pro, uh, project which is given to us by a government department and he says all the 20 engineers plus i we have got at least 10 years of experience and all our experience of constructing road put together we have together built several lakh kilometers of road in india so where am i wrong when i am saying maybe not my business has the experience maybe not this enterprise has the experience but we i and my employees my team and he said this thing with so much of passion that i could not help uh, admire him is it not correct what is an organization an organization is a sum total of all its employees after you take away the other factors like customers employees are the heartbeat heartbeat of any organization and uh, an employees an employee can make or mar employees can make or mar an organization so as per professor fernando uh, corporate responsibility of business to employees they must business must endeavor to promote a cooperative endeavor between employees and employers through participation and decision making employees must also participate in decision making so that they are able to improve production administration everything very noble so partis he is asking for a participative kind of a business in which decision making is participative of course second point is uh, well respected that business must pay fair and reasonable wages to laborers and fair salaries to executives so fair and reasonable wages to laborers and fair salaries to executives you will come across companies which in which the chief chief executives or the cxo level people they have a pay package of more than a crore rupee every year and the lowest paid employee let us say an executive of a the lowest paid executive or a officer he carries home 20000 or 240000 rupee per annum or let us say 3 lakh rupee per annum and so when it comes to when it comes to uh, a stage where organization has to trim down its workforce invariably people working at the lower level are trimmed first i don't know why so it is the duty of every business to pay fair and reasonable wages to laborers and fair salaries to executives so what should be the what should be the gap or the difference between the guy who is sitting at the top and the guy who is at the bottom of the pyramid this is a question which has been debated should the salaries of top executives be capped capped means should there be a uh, highest limit which should be or a kind of a ceiling that you can earn this and no more should it be variable mukesh amani very famously said that uh, he is not gone for a salary hike but then his salary which he gets his remuneration is linked his remuneration is linked to the profit that the company makes and the profits keep on increasing and he keeps getting more and more salary number 3 point is that the business must develop and adopt a progressive labor policy 
and recognition of genuine trade union rights, settlement of disputes and conciliation. See, what he is saying is that the laborers or the workers must believe that the business also belongs to them. There should be a feeling of them working as progressive partners who have a stake in the business. So, the overall environment of the business should be such, it, should, it is conducive, it in, enhances the quality of work life. Remember, we studied quality of life, quality of work life. It is up to the business to provide reasonable and just working conditions. Working conditions have to be nice. One thing, if the working conditions are bad, it can lead to uh, your workers getting sick, not reporting to work, absenteeism bad for it, bad, bad for the company. The central theme is that a laborer, even a laborer should, or a mechanic, person working at the shop floor, the, at the bottom end of the pyramid, they should be recognized as human being. There should be a respect for, one, his dignity should be respected, his liberty should be respected, individual liberty should be respected. I, I came across the case of a, of, of a driver who was driving the MD of a company and normally if you are driving MD of the company your salary is higher, you are, you are paid more but this guy was saying that you know there is no individual liberty to him although the salary is high so he was happy driving the car for a much junior employee because he thought that the MD was so far aloof and he had no care for his personal time, personal space Professor Fernando also says that business should provide facilities for joint consultation and collective bargaining. What is collective bargaining? Wherein uh, the, the unions or the associations and the management sit together, talk across one on one. Management by objective is that the company, the company gives, uh, sets reasonable working targets for the employees and upon employees achieving those targets, there should be an incentive system kind of a thing. So, also it is in the interest of the business to develop proper leadership from among the employees, from within the ranks, from within the ranks, so that one of the employee becomes a leader one day, promotion from within, that should be the endeavor, whether, whether this is the best way or not, I mean, the jury is still out. And last but not the least, businesses must guarantee religious, social and political freedom to workers to take part in civic activities. Does not mean they should, uh, business can allow people to uh, fight elections or go, for, you know, so not, not in the, not in the, not, not in the full time politics, but people can hold their views, their people can hold their religious views, their political views. And as long as it is not detrimental to the company, as long as this is not creating strife uh, within the company, it should be allowed. So this is the list of uh, uh, expectations from uh, business in terms of uh, what is their responsibility towards their uh, employees. Perhaps Perhaps the only thing which I can add as another point is that equally, equally, it should be the responsibility of the employees also to reciprocate the sentiments of the business owners. Like during the pandemic, if the, the, when, whenever a company is in crisis, the employees must volunteer to work extra hours without any payment of remuneration. And prove their loyalty. It's a boat, it's a two-way traffic. Employer alone cannot be noble and the employees, they are all uh, free-spirited people who don't want to give you back in return. So, there should be a sense of true partnership spirit between the business and the employee that is what makes that is what makes a business great that is what make a business glorious quality of work life is improved for all employees and eventually this will bring in more cash this will bring in more cash for the company i think this is it has been captured very well 
in this slide and uh, once again thanks to professor ac fernando and his book business ethics and corporate governance by peers in india now uh, in this final slide of the corporate responsibility not the final slide of this lecture but the final slide of the corporate responsibility of business to whom to owners and inter business establishments so does it not look a bit of a paradox that we are talking about the corporate responsibility of business to owners uh, this is because uh, when we talk of corporates many times there is clear separation of ownership and management let me give you an example of the public sector undertakings the owner of the public sector undertakings which is 100% per, uh, government owned is president of india so the government owns it and the management is vested in the hand of professional management or in case of let us say a company let us take the case of hindustan unilever limited hul the who who are the owners of hindustan unilever it's a diversified company uh, with the professional board and you cannot say that this person is a clear owner so shareholders are the owners and if unilevers of uh, uh, unilevers of uh, london they are owners but you know uh, the people who are running the day to day affairs are people who are Hind of hindustan unilever their board of directors and management like in case of itc who owns itc itc is a it's a widely held company so it is the duty of the corporate to provide a fair return or dividend on the capital investment of the capital invested because people invest in companies with an expectation of getting capital appreciation that is their share value will go up or they will get a dividend fair dividend every year many many core companies have a dividend policy so uh, i explained to you that when uh, uh, yogesh deveshwar did not declare dividend he he, he he declared reduced dividend he explained it to the shareholders that he wanted to use the saving in terms of retained earnings for further investments so you must be able to satisfy the shareholders that they are getting a fair return on their business either by way of dividend or that money which is not going as dividend which is being held as retained earnings it is being invested properly second point is you have to give fair and impartial treatment to all shareholders you cannot give uh, preferential treatment to some shareholders or some part owners of business and not to others develop healthy cooperative business relationship between different businesses now we are talking of the industry as a whole so uh, like we have cii we have asocham we have fiki these are various trade bodies and they are there to develop a healthy cooperative business relationship between various companies okay uh, for example there is nascom which is a national association of software companies right so they are there to ensure that the best practices of one company are followed by other companies although they are fierce rivals uh, when it comes to the bazaar place yet yet it is in their interest that in terms of developing good practices in terms of developing a highly evolved ethical code of conduct they all join uh, together they all work together fourth point is that corporate it is corporate responsibility to ensure that unfair trade practices like price rigging undercutting patronage unfair canvassing unethical advertisements they are kept in check it is in the interest of business as a whole and businesses should help their body should help in con in control of monopoly and they must try to promote healthy competition the practice where the big fish eat small fish is not good for the industry as a whole while industry members for example all cement uh, manufacturers they cannot 
form a trust and decide the pricing of the cement because it is anti consumer it is anti trust okay yet for a good cause they can come together as i covered earlier in the corporate social responsibility laws in india it is allowed that businesses can join hands to float up independent body which will look after the csr activities of two more than two companies so two companies can pool in their resources they are uh, they are 2% net profit and some of the employees and they can jointly contribute for a csr activity which will be in the benefit of both the companies which will be in the benefit of society as a whole so this is corporate responsibility of business to owners and inter business establishments so let's come to the point of the brass tacks how to attain csr how to implement csr because csr is a new field a relatively new especially in india uh, attaining csr under the new csr rules i have already explained to you you have to form a csr committee and uh, csr uh, there has to be a mention of csr in the audit on in the in the company's website what steps have you taken and then you have to mention <coughs> in your results what was the csr which was mandated required from you and how much you have done <coughs> but otherwise in general we international chamber of commerce which is a transnational organization of <coughs> more than 1000 uh, prestigious companies around the world they recommend some eight nine steps for attaining csr <coughs> on top is that there should be confirmation by the ceo and the board commitment to prioritize responsible business conduct <coughs> because csr essentially starts with first there has to be proper corporate governance in the company only then you can talk of csr you have to clearly state the company's purpose and agree on the <coughs> common company values before you embark upon a csr program <coughs> you have to identify key stakeholders you have to define the business principles and policies and in respect of csr you know you have to establish implementing procedures and management systems so you will have to <coughs> have a csr committee you will identify who are the people who are uh, eventually responsible for csr who are the people who will take active participation uh, in the csr but eventually the achievement of csr targets it vests with the ceo and the board of the company also you know you you have to benchmark against se selected external standards for example suppose you are going in the uh, you, you want to do a csr activity in the field of reducing uh, greenhouse gas uh, emission uh, effect so obviously this kind of a field is not so well developed in india so you need to benchmark your codes you need to benchmark your practices with already published results or already known results in other companies abroad for good implementation of csr you must set up a internal monitoring committee and any csr project which is meant for external communities you must use language which is understood by all simple language and last but not the least it says you have to establish pragmatic and realistic objectives you can't change the society in uh, you know one one or two years flat so your your objective should be realistic for example if you are uh, if if the csr activity is that uh, you would like to participate in the program for immunization then you cannot start with a full state you have to start with a few villages in which you will ensure that all necessary vaccination of all children of that village you will gradually develop expertise and then you will expand your frontiers from one village you can take cluster of village and if you are a big company eventually you know you could take control of a full block 
or a full tehsil. <coughs> if, for example, you uh, you want to be, if your CSR program is that you would like to start a scholarship for uh, students in tribal areas, then you need to identify the tribal area. And if the tribal area is close to where your factory is or where your establishment is, it will help. So you need to be pragmatic and you need, you need to have a, a realistic objectives. And when I said you have to benchmark against selected external codes and uh, standards, what I mean to say is if there is somebody, even within your country, if somebody who has achieved a measure of success, a degree of success, in your chosen field, then you need to uh, benchmark that company, you need to study their achievements and you need to tailor your own CSR program uh, accordingly. I am not saying you have to copy that program, but you need to, you can learn from their experiences. What were the obstacles they faced when they were implementing their CSR program? So this is the, I, I, the here I, am, I have uh, talked about the nine steps which have been given by International Chamber of Commerce and uh, International Chamber of Commerce uh, I am reading from the website ICC is the institutional representative of more than 45 million companies in over 100 countries our mission is to make business work for everyone every day every year and they have an office in India. I think the office is in, is in uh, New Delhi. But the corporate headquarters is in uh, Paris. Uh, I think the, in India their office uh, is in uh, New Delhi. So this is how you have, these are the steps for rolling out your CSR project. So by now we have uh, come to the realization that CSR projects, they are good for the business as a whole, for the industry, for the communities, for customers, all the stakeholders, for the country. And uh, But there are several obstacles in the implementation of CSR. And I have taken, I have uh, made this slide based upon the FIKI survey which was done in uh, 2016. FIKI is Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce uh, in in India, and uh, Federation of Indian sorry Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. It's a it's a association of business organizations in India, and it's a very old organization. Almost I think in 2027 you will be we will be celebrating 100 years of FIKI. It was set up by Ganesham Das Birla ji and Purshutam Das Thakur Das in 1927 on the advice of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Mahatma Gandhi said that businessmen are the trustees of the wealth of a country. Whatever resources are available to them, natural resources, financial resources, human or manpower resources, they belong to the nation and it is in their, <coughs> they are the trustees and they must develop all these resources for the ultimate benefit of mankind. So what are the obstacles? First obstacle as per FIKI is that inadequate clarity on laws and tax related regulation. Most, so, but for my students at least, I have given them a good explanation of the new CSR laws in India. So you need to, sometimes you need to understand the law and you need to understand whether you are, uh, what are the, what are the areas which qualify for CSR investment, what are the areas which not. Second point is many times you companies want to implement a project, but they fail to get non-objection certificate from competent authority. Clearance for land is not given for infrastructure projects. So in inadequate clarity on the laws. Second is the delay in project implementation due to red tapeism. Third is at time the suppose especially for CSR projects which are for the rural areas, FIKI survey says that the community fails to understand the development perspective 
underlying the project and and has inhibitions they they are too scared of participating so when the ultimate beneficiary is scared of participating in the program <clears throat> it's it's always the, the 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 program is always in geo party then ngo accreditation and availability of good and suitable ngos because you know companies don't specialize in doing non governmental work companies specialize in running their businesses to do anything which is in the social sector they depend upon uh, the uh, non governmental organizations or agencies which are specifically uh, in existence to do that job so such agencies such good and suitable ngos are far and few fifth is there is lack of skilled human resource that is willing to work at grassroots level so lack of trained csr professional for project implementation sixth is that if csr project it involves provision of healthcare facilities then getting doctors and medical staff in remote villages is a huge challenge to run primary healthcare uh, facilities in my own village in my own block headquarter in nani danda which is in podi garhwal it's very difficult to get a medical doctor who could man the primary health service so if there is a if let us say if, <coughs> if uh, bharat electronics limited which has a factory in uttarakhand it, it wants to adopt a particular village it wants to provide basic health services there it is very difficult for them to get doctors and nurses for that place seventh is conflict among local stakeholders so uh, Maybe, 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 maybe the revenue official is creating a ruckus. Maybe the local community is at uh, is looking at its own ulterior. Some of the members of the local community are looking at their own ulterior motives. But I personally think that conflicts among local stakeholders is common to all activities of human endeavor, not only business. Eighth point is that sometimes there is a lack of. clarity in understanding the csr terms among stakeholders and some they are not at equal level limitation of fund also sometimes is a uh, for the project implementation is also a major impediment <clears throat> and last but not the least is the lack of effective and transparent uh, monitoring mechanism if if the fund is going to the intended beneficiary what did we start off as with what objective in mind are we actually achieving that objective so the monitoring agency uh, monitoring mechanism is uh, lacking sometimes so these are some of the issues which uh, fiki survey reveals are there in implementing csr projects